Good morning, everyone. Thank you for being here. For many in our industry, the magnitude of the changes that are coming in August 2015 are just beginning to sink in. I mentioned on Wednesday in the Government Affairs Committee meeting that this is really a paradigm shift. And today, I would ask you to think about this as a marathon, not a sprint. Your association has an amazing panel lined up this morning. Each panelist is going to speak for a few minutes about some of the roadblocks to implementation that they think are important. And then we'll open it up for some questions from the audience as well. I'm going to tee up the question, the first question today, to give you all a chance to find a microphone. And then we'll have a good deal of time since this session is really for you to help you prepare for implementation in August of 2015. I want to thank all of the panelists for being here today. And I'd like to make a special mention to Penny Reed, who's sitting to my left, from Wells Fargo. <laughs> and, and Wells Fargo as well, because they're coming out ahead on implementation, as most in this room already know. And they're a very active member of this association. So thank you so much, Penny. You're welcome. <laughs> Anne, would you like to start off and share some of your thoughts with us? I would love to. Hi, everybody. This is an amazing time that we have in front of us. Allison has asked me to talk about the paradigm shift. First, I had to look up the word paradigm to make sure. <laughs> we all use it, but do we all know what it means? But it's a change in model, a change in process, and that describes very well what is coming our way. And I just wanted to hit a few points during my few minutes with you this morning. First of all, the form is the form. It's a form. For those of you that keep pushing, saying we need to have sessions to learn what each line means, if any of you have done closing since 2010, the form is the form. It's not that big a deal, except in 26 states where it will not work, but we're getting a little bit closer. <laughs> Another thing that I think we need to change in our minds is it's not three days in advance that the CD has to be produced. It's really seven days. I heard Penny mention that yesterday, and this gasp went up across the, across the room. But it really is seven days, because the only surefire three day in advance delivery is if we physically, personally hand the final closing numbers to the consumer. Even though the rule has given us the ability to deliver via email and start the three-day review period earlier if we have proof that the consumer has, one, signed an authorization to receive it that way, and two, that they've actually opened their email, we can start our count earlier. But there is no lender that I know that will rely on a consumer being home with email that's working and, uh, and, to, and rely on a consumer to open it in a timely manner. So as Penny said yesterday, it's not three days in advance. We will need to have our acts together seven days in advance. We can do that. We can absolutely do that. Frankly, as a closer, you know that if you tell me 30 days from now I'm going to close on a certain property, we can have our numbers done. So let's start thinking about seven days in advance. It will be our requirement. We'll have to put new systems in place. We'll have to talk to realtors earlier. We're going to have to talk to the tax collectors earlier. We're going to have to get our payoffs in. But do remember this. The requirement is that the consumer receives, the consumer by definition, the borrower, receives their numbers six days or, or three days in advance, depending on how you're looking at it. Most of those last minute gatherings are for the seller side. We don't have to do those well in advance. The seller receives their closing disclosure on the day of consummation. We never want to be the reason that closings are delayed. We never want to be that way. So let's start. We don't want to be in that position. So let's start now putting systems in place that we gather our information earlier. I mentioned to Penny before I was meeting with a regional lender. We were talking about how are we going to do this. That regional lender said, you know, it really doesn't matter. Because if we miss the deadline, we'll just 
postpone closing because we don't care when you close. Oh my God, <laughs> are you kidding me? Our opportunity now is to go out and talk to our lenders and assure them that we will have to them either in closing disclosure form or just the numbers at least seven days in advance. One thing that I am going to throw out to Penny, I know a lot of us were concerned when Wells sent out their memo a couple of weeks ago. Penny the next day had to listen on a conference call with me about my confusion. I was confused thinking that Wells was taking over the calculating, the gathering, the adjustment. No, we are going to still provide all of those numbers. Wells doesn't know that in a little town outside of Philadelphia in Lansdale Borough that you have to get a final electric reading because electric is leanable. They don't know that. They don't want to know that. We will still be involved. And this is what I've thrown out to Penny because the major pitfall that we see in their system, they have every right to decide what they want to do, is the day of closing changes. So Penny and I have been talking about could they please come up with a tiered system that will allow us in the majority of the closings to make the changes ourselves at the table as long as on that transaction it doesn't throw LTV out, doesn't change APR, and Penny is taking that back to her organization to talk to them about probably, Penny, 80% of the closings will be able to work within the system. Our biggest concern is the consumer, telling the consumer we can't close because we can't get that $57 adjustment on the sheet in t a timely manner is not going to fly well with the consumers. So we're going to work together. The paradigm shift is we need to change our processes. We need to start that now. We need to let the lenders know where the pitfalls are, but we have to go also in with solutions to them. The and I'm going to stop in a second. The, can you tell I'm wound up about this? The benefit to us, and there is a tremendous benefit to us. We need to understand the rule. We need to put our process side in place. And it's a great marketing opportunity for you to go talk to your lenders now, tell them what you can do, and quite possibly influence their decision as to how you will communicate and what you're going to do on the day of closing. Allison, thank you so much for letting me go on. I'll Thanks, stop Pam. now. Penny, would you like to share some thoughts with the group? Sure. Um, one of the things to sort of set the, the stage for what we're talking about as a paradigm shift, and I know some of you have heard me say this before, but when you try and combine these two forms, or it's three actually, the good faith, the truth in lending, and then the truth and lending and the HUD settlement statement, combining them under uh, two different laws that were not combined. When the CFPB moved that to under TILA instead of under RESPA, what really has changed is you're going from a transaction that was focused on a buy-sell transaction that sometimes had a mortgage, and over time, including in 2010, that form had to be modified to accommodate refinances. What you're moving to is a form that is focused on a mortgage that sometimes has a seller, but the entire focus of the form now is the mortgage. And, and if you think back to what the, the whole campaign with the CFPB, it was know before you owe, not know before you buy. So they're, they're laser focused on the mortgage transaction being correct. And when we, we went through all of the different versions or uh, proposals of how we could get that done and came to the conclusion, as you saw in our our newsletter, that the only way we can meet the requirements and be able to demonstrate to the CFPB that we met the requirements is to control that delivery, that actual completion and delivery of that form. Now, completing it, our anticipation is we're going to complete it in much the same way that you completed the HUD one today. So you could not do that without our numbers. In the future, we will not be able to do that without your numbers. We're not the experts on what goes on out in the, the local market. We're not the experts on how to close a loan. But we have to prepare that form. So what we have to do is just change the way we communicate or enhance, or what do we call it yesterday, enhanced communication, um, and, and how we talk back and forth. And there's a lot of things going on out there now looking at electronic ways of doing that. And it's going to go all the way down to, I'm sure, phone calls, um, depending on the size of the, the entities involved. But if you think of it that way, 
as it, the focus has changed from the buy-sell transaction to the loan, it, it'll help you understand why lenders are motivated to do some of the things they're doing. The, the biggest challenge I think we have in front of us as lenders is we're still in a, a situation where we don't know what we don't know. So you're the experts on how to close loans. We've been in this business for a long time. We know what our side of it looks like, and we're trying to anticipate everything that's going on out there. But we don't know all of the nuances, particularly when it gets down to state and local levels. When you're looking at these new regs and you're looking at these new forms and you're saying, I don't know how this works in you know, Adirondack, New York, or I, you know, we need feedback on that kind of thing. And one of the vehicles we use, those of you who have seen our newsletter, um, and it's still out there if you just Google it, you, you can get it. But there is a link in that to a survey that we've asked, and then there's an opportunity to provide comments. And um, Sally, who's here somewhere, is making sure that we keep that open for another week here after this conference so that anyone who hasn't had time to do that can go out there. But if there are things that you think we're not thinking of or you haven't heard are being addressed, please feel free. Do the survey, get us the comments, and we're reading all of them. And we are finding things that we have to get into our uh, work streams that we're working on as to how we're going to change. And the one other thing I just want to mention, just so everyone knows this, when we say that we're going to be doing this seven days early, we do realize that means we have to get our numbers ready too. <laughs> <laughs> so <laughs> I'll just put that out there now. <laughs> And I could turn it over to Richard. Thanks, Penny. <laughs> and I just want to highlight again what Penny said. Wells Fargo has a survey out. They're asking all of us, what do you think? They're, I, I've looked at the survey, and I know from uh, Sally yesterday in a meeting, she said several hundred, I think around 300, had taken the survey. And she mentioned out of about 19,000 who possibly could. So for those of you in this room who haven't done so, please um, accept Penny's invitation and go check out the survey and take it, please. Richard? <clears throat> I've got the, uh, the topic of legal considerations associated with a new disclosure. And there are uh, two ways to look at this. The whole concept behind the disclosure form has a, a, a happy side to it, which is informing the consumer, enabling the consumer to better understand the transaction, at least have enough information to be provided them to enable them to understand the transaction and therefore uh, minimize, ideally, the aggravation and the confusion that has historically been associated with a closing transaction. I know that for decades I have worked on refining my explanation of what exactly is the escrow adjustment, uh, what, uh, how come the APR is different from the amount on my note. So giving some of this information earlier is at least designed to have that, that happy effect. There is, however, a negative consequence, and that's the downside. The downside of failing to provide these disclosures accurately is going to be one of great concern to the lending community because, as we all know, the CFPB has decided, when in doubt, blame the lender. Well, there's a novel concept. <laughs> uh, and so the lenders are acutely concerned about making sure that these deliveries are done. It explains, and I fully understand why Wells, and I'm sure all of Wells' counterparts, want to have the uh, advanced ability to dictate and generate the form because they're the ones who take the fall if something is not done correctly. However, there's another document that we haven't talked about yet, and this is something that I think Everyone in this room, and particularly in conjunction with our uh, most active lender partner, uh, that's the lender's closing instructions. Because the lender's closing instructions often contain some little landmines that, uh, that enable the lender to turn right around and assert some liability and responsibility on the agent and therefore the underwriter in the event that uh, the documents that are disclosed, the documents that are provided, or the transaction generally does not meet with the, uh, with the terms and conditions of the lender's closing instructions. It is a contract, or at least it's treated like a contract. And so as we work through the next uh, nine months toward bringing this online, I think it's going to be very worthwhile to have a, uh, a constructive conversation between the, the lenders and the underwriters and agents on two documents since the interrelationship between the lender's closing instructions and the closing protection letter. 
because those do form an additional uh, relationship so that although the lender in the eyes of the CFPB is going to take the hit, we're right out there catching flack as well. And so I think that having uh, an ongoing communication so that we have an integrated series of documents that identifies who's going to do what for who is going to be very useful in making sure that uh, all the parties involved understand their responsibilities and execute them professionally. There's another downside, and uh, it's one that I always like to talk about, which is the uncertainty and the unlimited imagination of the plaintiff bar community. <laughs> uh, as many of you may know, I spent 10 years at Bank of America, so I have a particularly thin skin, like most lenders, about the, the remarkable uh, ingenuity that comes with a borrower who can't pay their loan back and as a result wants to find some excuse other than non-payment. And the, uh, the new disclosure forms, I think, are going to be uh, potentially uh, rich new territory for blame placing and, uh, and excuse making and probably litigation, very possibly uh, class action litigation. It's always, uh, it's always associated with disclosures. One thing I think history has shown us is that the court system does not is not comprised of a lot of folks who have a really good understanding of the intricacies of the real estate business. It's astonishing uh, how many times cases go way beyond where they should. Uh, we, had, uh, we had some discussions earlier this week in the uh, Title Council Committee talking about some of the outrages that have happened that, that betray the fact that courts don't necessarily get it, but they have the power to make it so. And, uh, and so to that end, I just uh, believe that it's important that we really get our, uh, our documentation and our interrelationships well identified because we have not only the regulators to consider, not only the reality of making sure that we get the transaction right for the consumer's benefit, but the great unknown, which is somebody with a, with a sharpshooter uh, on his behalf trying to find some way to pick the pocket of folks for potentially innocent mistakes. Thank you, Richard. Linda? Well, my portion is with regards to the ability to respond to these timing, to the timing requirements. So when we're talking about timing requirements, what are we really talking about? We're talking about data. We're talking about the technology that goes with it. Um, we talked about talking earlier, communicating earlier. Uh, we're talking about the legalities of the forms, and we're talking about the, getting the numbers. So what we're talking about is the technology of getting data from one place to another. I mean, we're settlement agents in the room. We're title people in the room. Uh, there's realtors, lenders. We're all intelligent people. We are all creative people. We're going to get through this, but the thing is, how are we going to get through this? Um, if there hasn't ever been a time where we need to know each other's businesses the most, mm -hmm. it's now. And I've always been a multitasker, and if anybody knows me, they know that's true. But I need to put on an agent's hat for part of my day. I need to put an underwriter's hat on for part of my day. Um, I'm not going to practice law for part of my day, but... Just I, Mondays. Just Mondays, yeah. exactly, from 9 to 10. I need to be in the lender's shoes. I need to be in the consumer's shoes, okay, to think about how the CFPB is looking at this. So, as you had said, these forms are just paper. I'm not afraid of paper. I'm afraid of what the paper means, how we get the information onto that paper. So we're not just dealing with these new forms. We're dealing with the new process. We're dealing with the new software programs, new data requirements, uh, new flow of information, flow of data back and forth, um, new relationships. There are a lot of new relationships in this room because of these new forms. And then new training. What's they, what do they say, can't teach an old dog new tricks? Well, we have to learn a lot of new tricks now, um, both internally, externally, and cross brands and cross industry. So in order for me to get a little bit better of an idea of the scope of this technology going back and forth, I did a very unscientific survey, but I did talk to a couple software companies, I spoke to a couple operations managers, and I talked to a data security expert. 
And there were three areas that I wanted to talk to them about. I wanted to talk to them about the timing. I wanted to talk to them about what their perfect scenario would be. And then I also wanted to talk to them about the happy side, the marketing of this. Um, so with regards to the timing, I'm gonna get just a little tad bit technical, but like I said before, we all have to have other hats and we have to have literally an IT hat on too. We have to make sure that the systems that we have in place right now, no matter what they are, if they're a system that you built on your own to do title and escrow, or a larger company, smaller company, um, a midware company, that everything that they do, you know how they do it. Because if you don't know how they do it, then you don't know how that exchange of information is happening. So you have to be an IT person. Um, you have to be a little bit knowledgeable about data security. You have to be knowledgeable of actual systems. And unfortunately, unlike these new forms, these systems aren't tangible all the time. Yeah, there's hardware and there's servers, but what about you know, the cloud? You know, exchange of information, encrypting, SSLs, um, all kinds of things that are going on behind the scenes that we don't know about and that we rely on our IT people. But I, I bet it's safe to say though, most agents, IT people, might be the owner, mm -hmm. might be a closer. You know, we're not all big companies, so we have to think like small company and big company. So when we're looking at this data going back and forth, how safe is it gonna be? Consumers have to know that their information is safe. When, when we look at communication, we look at being able to encrypt a lot of the documents because they have a lot of non-public personal information, including the six items that a lender needs just to have a loan application. There's only six little things mm -hmm. that a loan officer needs. If he, if he or she gathers just these six items, then they have to issue a loan estimate within their three business days. And by the way, you know, we talk about encryption, and even though the lenders, and I look at Penny, I don't mean just you, Penny, you know that. <laughs> um, but lenders here. in general, yeah, she's here. <laughs> we're the ones that told us as a best practice, they want data encryption. They want to make sure that their information that they're providing us is safe. But lo and behold, who are the ones that are telling us not to send encrypted emails? We're getting a lot of you know, lenders that are pushing back on this data encryption. So it's kind of funny that the ones that want us to go there are telling us, oh, we don't need that today. Send it via regular mail or fax it to us. So we I talked a little bit about software providers about that. And then what else do they think they need in order to make this work? Um, you've probably seen a lot of companies kind of sprouting up and it, they're called midware. They're kind of like the middleman. They take uh, the, the software systems that we have and they look at the systems that a lender has because a lender can have several different systems even within their own company, their own branches, large lenders, small lenders, all different systems. How do we get these two systems to kind of talk to each other? So that's where the, the middleman came in, this midware came in. And we have some of them in our vendor showcase as well. So they're able to kind of talk both languages be able to take the information from our system and extrapolate it and get it to the lender system. So I guess what we need to know is who's gonna relay that information? How quickly can we get it? Now in a rate filed state, it gets to be a little easier because you have one set of rates for that state. You can go on to a robust GFE calculator, mortgage calculator online, uh, many of your underwriters have systems already in place and many of you have them as well. But what about the states that don't have their rates filed, where every agent has a different set of fees and charges? How are they gonna be able to get that information to the lenders in a very quick, timely manner? Unfortunately, I'm not here to answer that question <laughs> <laughs> because everything is changing so quickly. Um, in the beginning, it kind of sounded easy enough, but it's not. It's gonna be very difficult to get good information to the right people within the time frame. 
But as agents and as underwriters on our side of the business, our job is going to make the lender compliant because if they don't get the numbers from us quickly, they're the ones going to get dinged for it. And if they get dinged for it, guess what? They don't want to work with us. So we want to communicate that with them as well. I asked a few um, people about what their perfect scenario was. And the more I asked the question, the more the, the answer became simple. So I'll synopsize about 12 people's answer when it came to a perfect scenario. Make access easy. Keep the info safe. Mm -hmm. And get it done quick. That was it. And at first, the answers were very long and laborious, but once we broke it down, those are the three things everybody wants in the transaction. So let's kind of turn that frown upside down <laughs> and talk about marketing a little bit. Mm -hmm. um, because like Doug Duncan said yesterday, um, if, if you're not running fast enough, you're going to become a speed bump. I never thought I would use an economist joke. <laughs> that's, that's, I'm, I'm really... Embarrassed. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> so let's talk about the marketing of it. Uh, and when we talk about marketing, we're not talking about just selling something or developing somebody's business, but true marketing, going out there and marketing what we have to the lenders, to the realtors, to the attorneys, to everybody in the transaction, including the consumer. The consumer is going to become a lot more aware of what's going on. There are going to be a lot of great ways to market. Uh, number one, if you have a free hour this afternoon, I have a whole hour talking about the marketing. But simplistically, we need to get the message to our realtors, our lenders, that we can make those three w things easy. We can make the information gathering easy, we can make it accurate, and we could keep it safe. And if we market ourselves in that way, that we are here to play in the sandbox. We're not here to push back. We know the rules are changing. And they're going to keep changing. They're going to change from now till well beyond August of 2015. So the one main thing in talking to a couple marketing people was the accuracy piece. Because what happens when you do one mistake? You can do 20 closings the best. You get handshakes, pats on the back, flowers at your door, but you do one transaction bad. What happens? You lose a lot of business. So on that note, marketing accuracy is the key. Thanks so much, Linda. I heard, I'm hearing a theme throughout the conference. I'm hearing communication, relationships, planning, and my marathon analogy I think is a really good one. We're nine and a half months out and it's certainly, if I were training for a marathon, it would not be too soon to start. So I hope this is giving you some ideas to think about and also questions to formulate. I'm going to tee up a, a question for the panel. Um, Wells has shared, Wells Fargo has shared that it will be preparing and delivering the closing disclosure. I'm wondering if the panelists are hearing what other lenders might be planning on doing. I, um, I can't name names, mm -hmm. but I was uh, two weeks ago at the, the MBA Regulatory Compliance Conference, and um, we, we really worked hard to make sure that we got that newsletter out before that conference specifically because we knew what that timing was going to be. So we were able to talk about it there. And I had a number of lenders, all of whom names you'd recognize, come up to me afterwards, number one, just to thank us for <laughs> taking a public stand so that they can um, come in behind us. Nobody wanted to be first. But um, my understanding is there's quite a few of the, at least of the larger lenders and some other mid-sized that you would recognize the names who are, they were already leaning in that direction. And we're hesitant to say so because we haven't figured everything out yet, how it's going to work. But we, we all know that uh, from a compliance standpoint, we have to go there, so we have to figure it out. And I think it was helpful for us to, to get that out there. And I think other lenders will be moving in that direction. I think you might see differences in very small markets where you have a local community bank and there's a title agent who's sort of across the street and down the block that they've always dealt with. They're going to have a different relationship than mm -hmm. a, a larger institution who 
has multiple different agents closing our loan. And I think to that point, Penny, that's, that's where our opportunity is to go and talk to our lenders now. They're, they're in the process of making a big decision that will truly affect the way we can serve the consumer. So why not be a part of the conversation now with them so that they can make a good decision and that they will look at you as a solution to some of the pitfalls that, that you will find. But now is the time to talk to them. Yeah, I can't, I can't disagree with that at all. You have I'm to glad. be proactive. Um, you have to talk to the real estate agents that are out there. Talk to your local uh, lenders. I haven't seen too many lenders um, providing any written information, but when we're going in and asking them the question, they're almost asking us some more questions. <laughs> so what a great opportunity to kind Absolutely. of say, okay, this is the process that we think will work. What do you think? What can we do to help you get that information to you pre-order as quickly as possible? Penny, I really think that it's wonderful that you did get that document out before the regulatory conference. I think it's wonderful that the other lenders are acknowledging your leadership. I, I personally, and I'm sure we all appreciate the fact that you took a stand, took the risk, went, did the hard work to go through that challenging document and come up with something that at least gives us a framework to start working around. And, uh, and I think it's, it's greatly appreciated by one and all. And I do have a suspicion that some of the other lenders whose names will not be mentioned <laughs> will probably um, provide you with the highest form of, of a compliment, which will be <laughs> copy it shamelessly. So we'll just have to wait and see. Audience questions? I'm sure there are some. The lights are quite bright, so we can't, we can't, can't really yeah. see. But I know there are folks in the audience on staff that will hand you a mic. Yes, Jack. Thank you all. Uh, two questions. First, Ann, can you um, give us a little bit more information on the seven days? Mm -hmm. We've been thinking three days, and I do understand about the delivery and how you prove delivery, and I'm sure that's part of your seven days. So could you give us a little bit more information on the magic of seven days? And secondly, Allison, can we dig a little bit deeper on the communication aspect of how we transfer information between the lender and the title agent? Now, as far as Wells Fargo and large lenders, there's going to be one format probably. But with the local community bank, who doesn't necessarily have the system that Wells Fargo has, how are we going to communicate with them? So I want to dig a little bit deeper on that. Thank you. Thank you, Jack. The, the rule is written that the consumer must receive the information, the final closing disclosure, three business days prior to consummation, which is also uh, defined. Within the rule, it says it de then defines delivery. If you hand the consumer the final numbers, then you may start your three-day count then. If you put the final numbers in the U.S. mail, there is an assumption that it will take three days to get to the consumer via mail, and then the three-day count starts. That's automatically six days there, Jack. If you email the closing disclosure, there is an assumption in the rule that it takes the consumer three days to open email, and then the three-day review period starts. That's six days in advance. I say seven, Jack, because we need to get our numbers to the deliverer so that they can deliver six days early. When the final rule came out, it was written that if you have proof that your consumer has opened their email, first of all, the consumer has had to have signed an authorization to receive disclosures via email. I'm sure that's going to be in place with all of the lender packages early on. If they've signed the authorization and you have proof, a read receipt of some sort, that the consumer opened their email, then you can start your three-day count earlier. But what lender is going to rely on that three-day delivery via email, praying, hoping that the email is received, that it's open, that the box is checked, that the read receipt goes back, that their email isn't down? None of the lenders will rely on that. So they're all going to, I'm assuming, they're all going to back up to making delivery six days prior to consummation, which means to us 
providing them with information timely so that they can meet that six-day send. Well, and Anne brings up a good point that ties right into your question, Jack with um, the delivery aspect of it and the communication back and forth, the larger lenders, I'm sure, are going to have a more automated process that's going to tie in with a lot of our software. But the mid-size and the smaller lenders may be a completely different story. And something we've addressed on our Integrated Mortgage Disclosures Task Force as well, that we're going to see a variety of ways. So there could be agents that have a dozen lender partners, and that communication is going to happen differently for each of those or how the lender wants that to be done. Who's preparing and delivering could vary. The, the tracking mechanism that they want for proof of delivery if the settlement agent is doing that for them. So I think that is a good question and again goes back to the theme of communication and talking about this up front. Other questions? Hi. Um, my question is, hi Penny, hi. probably for you. Uh, multiple purchasers uh, signing a loan for delivery. Now, I should know this, probably I forgot it. Um, do you have to have each different, not husband and wife, but each different purchaser, consumer, open that email? Um, as far as I know right now, it really depends on whether or not they're co-mortgagors or they're just non-borrowing in title. And there are differences there um, that we're still trying to work out. On, on, I think, I, I believe, don't hold me to this because I'd have to go back and look it up, but with a co-borrower, it can be sent to one. But with a non-borrowing in title, you have to get that other person as well. Unless it's a refinance, right. and on a refinance, any party that has the right to rescind must yes. receive. So it's, it's going to be a little more complicated than it is today. Of course. Just a little bit. <laughs> Somebody's trying. We're having a game of pass the mic. Bear with who, us for a moment. Who, set, who sets the closing date? Who set the closing date? Pardon Who's me? Gonna, who is going to set the closing day? In my state, it's generally the realtor. Right. And that's part of the education process we're going to have to go through with NAR and their uh, member base as to how we look at closing dates and how they get set. Today, a lot of times, I know you've seen contracts of we where the time frame is very short, and we're not entirely sure that the, the length of time that we have when we have to count days from good faith and the six date elements, and then you have to wait before you can do uh, the actual rest of the application or collect the rest of the data, you're sort of counting forward, using up about 10 days in that forward, and then you're counting backwards. Um, it's leaving a very narrow window in there to get things done if people are writing a 30-day contract. So uh, agreed on a purchase, it's still going to be the realtor. That's what we go by is that date. Um, but also remember, I, I, I believe that the um, inability to meet the date that's in the contract is not necessarily considered a bona fide financial emergency mm -hmm. by the CFPB as a reason to um, not restart the three days. So we're all going to have to do a lot of coordination. And that's a behavior change for the realtors as well. You know, one, one thing to remember about this whole process is, you know, when you think about things and you think, oh, that's going to delay it for the consumer, and then they'll have time to second guess. If you ask the CFPB, they'll go, perfect, that's just what we want them to do. So they're not, they're, their whole purpose of doing this is about the consumer. It's impacting all of us, but it isn't about us. It's about them. So sometimes what we think is a negative impact to the consumer is actually the impact they may want to have happen. If I could just piggyback on the Realtor, uh, this is why we need to talk to our local Realtors, <clears throat> excuse me, because they need to be educated with regards to their own mm -hmm. contracts and how they relate to the new forms. There are several boards across the country that are coming up with new contracts, and I pulled up about 10 of them, and nine of the 10 already had some language in them that contradicts some of the timing. <laughs> So I think it's going to be great if, like Wells, talks to NAR to get at least some of the realtors on board. Because a lot of real estate agents, I mean, when I used to sell real estate a long time ago, once you got to contract, you're done. 
You were just waiting for the closing. But now real estate agents have to thoroughly be invested in the entire process from contract to closing. Right. And speaking of closing, I know we just have a few minutes left. Anne, I wondered if you could speak to the closing statement because we're seeing software here, we're talking about that as far as the closing itself and the CDF, the closing disclosure form, and the closing statement. Yeah, thanks, Allison. I, I know I said in the very beginning, the form is the form. It's not a big deal. It's a big deal to our software companies. Don't, don't <laughs> get me wrong on that. They have a tremendous job ahead of them. But in 26 of our states, the way that the rule is written, the requirement on how we calculate and display the title fees in 26 states will not work. Seriously, it will not work. The cash to close does not calculate properly. Up until yesterday, we have had a lot of pushback from CFPB saying, well, that's the rule. You guys will have to just refile your rates or figure out how to handle this. Up yesterday, we did have a real good response from one of, the, one of our CFPB friends saying, let's talk about this some more. My thought up until yesterday was this. This form, that the closing disclosure form in those 26 states is just going to become another form in the pile. We will have the signature line signed because the signature line on that form says by the consumer it's just stating that they've received a copy. The signature line actually says you don't have to go ahead with this transaction. We're going to have that in the pile in those 26 states and we're going to create our, our own closing statement so that we can say to the consumer, sign here, but look, here are your numbers. And frankly, I've been thinking about this. In my operations in, in those states, we are going to go back to the pre-2010 form and use that for our ledger sheet and as our explanatory sheet. I, I don't know if we're going to need to do that if we do get some help from the CFPB fixing this one problem, your task force. Um, has been working on this for a long, long time. But also remember this, the CFPB in the rule has given us a seller-only closing statement. A lot of the closing change, a lot of the changes that happen at closing, those last minute things, help it happen on the seller's side. So great, if we're using only a seller statement for that half of the transaction, we'll be able to easily bring that to fruition. So stay tuned in your 26 states, because right now it doesn't work. Thanks, Ann. I know our time is short. I wish we had time for one more question. Is that possible? Not that I could see if they told me no, so why don't we try? Yes, Maddie said yes. So, Pen Penny, I know you can't answer for the other lenders, but right now we often get, don't know anything about the loan instructions that we're going to be receiving until we actually receive them maybe the day before closing, okay? With all of these changes, and the timelines that are so sensitive under this new rule. My question is, will we be getting something at the beginning of the transaction letting us know how you as a specific lender are going to expect us to be able to time our stuff through the process? Uh, one, I think one of the things you've probably, depending on what meetings you've been at here, you've heard a theme throughout. Um, uh, we talked about it a lot in the Universal Agent ID meeting, is that we are all looking for a way to communicate way earlier in the transaction. Because one of the things we realize, and if, and if lenders haven't gotten there yet, they will rapidly, is that we need to, it, it's not just going to be a last minute communication, and it can't just be moving the last minute up seven days and still having a last minute. We actually have to communicate much earlier in the process. And that is some lenders, I'm sure, will do it through technology, and it will be all the way down to the community bank level where they're going to have to be communicating in, in their own way, but it will have to be much earlier in the transaction. The, the thing you'll see that makes it difficult is that whole issue of how long a lender has to wait before they can collect additional data after they issue the loan estimate. So they may not be able to communicate much to you in that little window. Thanks, Penny. And I know we have to wrap up. I just want to remind everybody, planning, training for the marathon is going to help you be successful for implementation. It's going to position you and your organization and those in it for success. And most importantly, it's going to be a benefit to the consumer. So I thank all of you 
for your time. And I know none of us are running away. We'll be around today <laughs> if you want to continue the discussion offline afterwards. Thanks so much.